Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I'm Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Liz Lerman, who in addition to a little bit of background that I'm about to share, I also just consider uh, a great friend and colleague and someone who I have looked up to literally my entire professional career. So it is extraordinarily exciting for today's show. Um, but not only a choreographer, performer, writer, educator, speaker, recipient of numerous honors, I could go on and on, but certainly we should mention a MacArthur Genius Fellow, uh, 2011 United States Artists Ford Fellowship in Dance and a Deutsch Fellow, and was named the first institute professor at the Herberger Institute for Design and the Arts at Arizona State University. And I'm very excited to say that Arizona State ASU Gamage is our creative partner for this show and have co-curated this enabling Liz to be able to be on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Erin, I'm just so glad to be here with you. Really happy to see you and be in your midst in these difficult times. It's just, you know, good to be reminded of if you get to be in our fields together long enough, you have a chance to build these relationships. And I'm full of gratitude to be with you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you so much. And so, you know, I thought I'd actually just really dive right in because, you know, movement and, and choreography and so much of what you do relates to or reflects or speaks to discord. And um, literally in my life, I don't think I could imagine a point in time for our nation when we've been in greater discord. Um, and just wondering if you could talk, I was knowing that our audience are, are people across all arts disciplines um, and who may not really see or understand a lot of aspects of dance. Um, and so just wondering if you could kind of speak to the, the role that you feel the arts play at times like this, and especially as we experience discord. Yeah, you know, there's a lot to say in the questionnaire and I might start with the, with the thought that I believe the act of making art, especially making art together, not just me making it so you can come see me, but all the ways in which we engage people together. The act of making art in it of itself is, is, is a stance of hope, even if the art is not hopeful. Uh, it, is, it is this commitment to making and to being together and to struggling with the ideas and to trying to figure out what do I need to say here? What do I need to say there? As for the embodiment piece, you know, this is the thing that is so Im really important to me right now. I was working with the beautiful Ruby Morales, who's going to co-teach with me a workshop on building community for a whole bunch of college dancers. And she's another generation. She comes out of Latinx community. She's just extraordinary. And we've decided to focus on how you embody the difference between coping and resilience. And for example, you know, if you just put yourself in a coping position, you'll feel yourself dropping down, you'll feel the tightness, you curve inward, you know, and if you're trying to, even your hands go like this, whereas, you know, if you were in a resilient place, your knees would be soft, your arms would be open, you'd be, just that, even that helps people understand. And then what does it take to move between those things? So, you know, what I yearn for is the possibility that people have a chance to see that their bodies are a canvas for so much knowledge making and learning and discovery. And of course, then for making the beautiful things that we want to make uh, that make us artists too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's amazing. And even just hearing you describe it and seeing you move, I just, I felt that. And, you know, it was interesting because even, you know, I have, uh, you know, entrepreneurship courses where I teach about resilience, but it was the way that you just captured it, the, the physicality of resilience versus, versus coping, I, I think is so key in that how it sometimes helps us understand what it is that we're experiencing, that physicality. Um, along those lines, kind of, right, a lot of people 
um, you know, are aware of the, you know, either division in our country or of the, the um, immediate health implications from, from COVID. Um, but obviously the mental health implications coming out of COVID, which not only come out of the disease itself, but also the economic disease that we've experienced, all of these things. Just wondering if you have, you know, thought about, um, and, and of course I sometimes ask questions that I, I might have some uh, ideas about, but have you thought about this obviously connection between the arts, between movement and mental health? You know, I, I, I'd say something um, I think that's interesting about the pandemic is that it's so shocking and the situation on our streets is so shocking that in some ways it shocked, I'll say for now the art world, but I mean many things by that. It shocked it out of its resistance to understanding the power that lives in our art that we have not always practiced in Western versions of it. So for example, why would dance therapy be separated from the practice of making dances for the stage? Why are those two different things? I mean, yes, they are different. And yes, maybe you study them differently, but when one dismisses the other for whatever reason, you're stuck in a hierarchy and a ranking and you're not accessing the things that are so important. So what's been interesting to me is to hear how much healing, not necessarily healing, you know, let's have unity and I'll get back together again because we, you know, we need to talk about issues of white supremacy and the implications of that. I don't mean healing, just let's make that all okay. But when more and more people are talking about the nature of healing, self-care, what is this? And for me, where that's gone in movement is actually bringing in the spirit and thinking a little bit about ritual and how ritual also, to me, has been an aspect of art making you know, for thousands of years, even though we may have removed it from some of our notions in the West. But when I think about, for example, coming back to the theater, in fact, Gamage is where I'm gonna premiere a new work as soon as we're able, it'll be there. Um, you know, I've been thinking, you know, what are audiences gonna need? It's a piece about witches, so we can get into all that. Then the second half of it is, um, and what, and how can the witches help? But I'm, I think ritual is going to be a piece of this because I don't know how else we can enact the ways we want to, well, find ourselves into the future. Wow. So you know, one of the things I'd love to try to do is to give my audience a window into your creative mind uh, as much as as you will let us in, um, and. And, and by that, what I mean is say, for example, creating right, this new work. When, when you're starting with, a, a, if you will, kind of just a blank canvas of, of, of artistry, how, where do you go? How does a work come about? Can you kind of share with us how that happens in your creative process? Yeah, well, and again, this is where I'm lucky as a mover because I am a talker you know, and a thinker, and that these things go together. They're not exclusionary. I, I sort of live in a world of multiplicity. Mm -hmm. So in this particular case, and this is often what happens, I'll be thrust in a situation and shocked by what I see. In this case, it was an exhibit, 500 years of drawings of witches. I wasn't interested in witches when I entered. When I came out, I was furious. I was mad. I was screaming. I was like, what? Who's, who thinks women's bodies are like that, you know? So off I went, but then it turns into a real research period. What is this about? What could it be about? What's important? What do I need to get at? And a lot of testing, and this is where rehearsals, you know, Aaron, I don't know how people live their lives without rehearsals. Uh, you know, rehearsal is an opportunity to, to work through things in a collaborative effort where you get to make mistakes over and over again publicly. And, 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 you, and learn from the mistake and keep going. I mean, you, there's so much that goes on in rehearsals that I, I just can't imagine trying to think without them. So in my case, without the performers and without the, the music and the sound and the, the beautiful projectionists and all the people that are helping to bring this to bear, we sort out what needs to be said and what not. I had a whole thing ready to go. We were gonna premiere actually at Jacob's Pillow. And the idea was the witches were, um, which is because they survived previous extinctions. That's what I had made, what we were making. And I wow. love the idea of the knowledge that emerged from that. But I don't think that's the piece people are gonna to wanna to see when they come back from the pandemic. And so, oh, okay, we're changing it. 
Wow. So this is, and also I'm just still wrapping my head around how you just shared about rehearsing. Um, because I think that is so much, you know, and often, you know, underrated as part of the process. And, uh, and for some even looked upon kind of frustratingly, like, yeah, let's get done with rehearsal so we can get to a, a performance. But that kind of passion and love you, you seem to have for the rehearsal process, um, which I think is also so important thinking about the development of, of craft, right? Taking something from either idea or dream, but actually then building the excellence of the craft of the discipline to actually enable what it is that you want to say. Yes. And I think I love that you use the word craft. I just love that because sometimes it's all conceptual and you're freewheeling and sometimes it's no, it's the difference between, you know, really is it is a hand like this? Or maybe it's better if it's like, you know, and we can, you know, get into it. And one thing I think about rehearsals, and, and this may be an issue about different disciplines or even the nature of the ensembles that I'm interested in being a part of. But to me, you can't make work without, well, I like to think about risk, purpose, and love, that, that all three of those things are present. You are at risk. You don't know what's going to, you have purpose. And you asked me in that first question, why are we even doing this? But you really need to have love. And when I realized that I was spending more time with my collaborators than I was with my family, when you think about the nature of the hours in a day, you know, I had to figure out how to make this valuable. And in some ways, it's that kind of thinking that every, every second matters. It's after all, we're, you know, we're living our life, it matters. It's things like, and that's where the critical response process got to develop and things like that, looking for, looking for processes and protocols that help us be together in a better way. Oh. Well, it's unfortunately, we're beginning to run a little short on time, unfortunately, I probably only have a chance for one more question, but I think about this inspiration, right? I think about all of the work that you do, right, which is so extraordinary. When, when these times are tough or when we see these things in, in, in our world that, um, you know, make us uh, want to cover and, and maybe even retreat, what do you do? Where, where do you go either for inspiration? How do you tap upon strength so that you can be resilient? Whether it's the frustrations of making a new work happen, whether it's the frustrations of how people are treating each other in our society, where do you tap into? How do you access the ability to be resilient? Well, it's a, a very beautiful question. And uh, probably I would answer it differently at different stages in my life, but Right now, um, I am taking such enormous pleasure in my uh, walking partners. Now, we don't actually walk in the same space. We're in different parts of the world, but we are, on, we are with a phone or something and we are walking and talking. And I have beautiful colleagues here at ASU, scientists and others who just invigorate my mind, but long held partners like Jawe Zahler, who I've been in conversation with for you know, over 30 years. And um, a group of people now, these are mostly all younger than me, um, beautiful, amazing artists. Um, and I know they think I'm mentoring them, but it's not, I'm not, they're mentoring me. It, I think of these as like these mentoring circles where where the nature of, you know, they may ask me, but how, how was it possible to get all those old people dancing because somebody wants to say work in a prison? And it's renewing for me and refreshing for me to get to go back and think about how did that work? But at the same time, I'm watching this person lead, you know, Street Symphony, Vijay Gupta, whom I'm about to talk to as soon as we, we finish, we'll take a walk together for an hour. I'm so lucky, Aaron, because um, I feel, uh, pushed and prodded and asked to keep moving myself to a more bold place. So, uh, and I think that's a good thing. Wow, and this, so, and that's amazing because I haven't actually done that or experienced, but where you walk with people remotely and just stay on the line. So it's as if they're there walking with you. And just a quick question, is that something that you think, was that precipitated by the pandemic events? And, and do you see it continuing after? Well, 
you know, I have something called the treadmill tapes, which would, would be fun to talk about another time where this was a uh, project where treadmills are together in a museum and I'm walking with somebody for an hour and it's all recorded and then it's put up and you can walk because if you walk together, usually somewhere around 40, 45 minutes, something happens. So I have a, a, a history of walking with people, but it's in the pandemic, I've always been like with them. The pandemic has made it that we are in totally different parts of wherever. And um, yeah, and the, what of course that does is it allows you to be out again in, in nature or on the street or in life, even while you're, so you know, you're practicing that thing that artists need to do, right? Well, that everybody can, internal and also, you know, open to the world. It's truly extraordinary. Liz Lerman, you are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. I cannot thank you enough for joining us here on the show. Thank you, Aaron. Beautiful to be with you.